Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Tech Days Online. I'm Andrew Fryer, an evangelist at Microsoft in the UK, specializing in Windows Server. But this morning's session is about Windows 8. So, Simon, what do you do? So, I mainly talk about uh, Windows 8 and about uh, our client offerings. So, how we use client offerings in terms of uh, the server components that go along with that. So, things like VDI, things like dynamic access control, things like uh, DA as well. So, plenty of uh, different bits and bobs that come from the server offering in order to actually um, enable us to do far more with desktop. Yes, so uh, there's so much stuff in Windows 8, it's actually quite difficult to remember it all. So it uh, just putting absolutely. Simon on yep. the spot there. Particularly when it's all <laughs> lots of different acronyms. So uh, lots and lots of uh, new features for us to, uh, to go and have a look at. We're going to take uh, a, a look this morning through, um, well, basically we're going to start off with VDI and have a look at how uh, VDI has evolved with Windows 8 and with Windows Server 2012 and some of the new experiences that we can actually put into place as a result of having both of those things working together. Then we're going to come back from that session and we're going to have a look at deployment and what's changed in deployment with specifically uh, tooling around Windows 8. So the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit 2012, how that's changed. We're also going to have a look at the ADK, the, um, uh, the deployment kit for Windows. And we're also going to have a look at a couple of other um, little areas around that that help us to deploy applications. So they can be the new AppX packages in Windows 8. However, Simon, all of that shows you how. I think perhaps we ought to do a little bit of why. First Absolutely. Of yep, we ought to do a little bit of the whys. So why are we doing this? Well, essentially, the world of devices has changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. If we look back at uh, a couple of years ago, everybody had uh, lots of nice, thick, chunky laptops. Generally, they were um, made, made available in fairly nice, dark, boring colors, a um, little bit black, not particularly uh, interesting bits of kit. But they were really, really functional, really powerful pieces mm. of equipment. And that was kind of the world that we um, gave birth to Windows 7 into, where people had all that kit. Over the past few years, things have evolved much more. We now see uh, many more touch-friendly kind of experiences coming along, and people really wanting to interact with their devices with touch. And in fact, if we look at the next generation of hardware that the, um, that the OEMs are producing, it's all touch-related. Mm. Everybody's got touch screens in there, be it a, a, a little terminal that, uh, say, is created by WISE, where they're going to be expecting to use touch on that terminal. Yep. Be it a, an Ultrabook, we're going to expect to see Ultrabooks with touch. And, and I think our boss has got some massive 55-inch monster on Absolutely. Him, behind him yep. on his desk. Obviously, Absolutely. We, we Obviously, this is not quite a touch screen. We have a couple of uh, here. nice touch screens <laughs> upstairs. Uh, but this isn't quite a touch screen. Of course, the really cool thing that we can do with all of this, we, we're actually able to um, move into a world where we can enable all of those touch experiences. And Windows 8 is obviously um, often called a touch-first operating system. Everything is nice and easy for us to touch. But yep. underlying all that, we have all of the great stuff that we know from Windows 7 that allows us to do management. In fact, it's not just from Windows 7. If we look back for sort of the past 10, 15 years, we've been really, really good at making operating systems that are manageable by enterprises. Yeah. So you can push your controls down if you need to do that. You can push your, um, all of your requirements down from a corporate governance level if required. You can also get information back and we can monitor and manage those machines far more effectively um, in a Windows environment than in any other environment well, out there. I, I guess one of the things for me is, is we, you know, if we look at this very simple slide up here, we've got on the, on the one, one hand, we've got you know, the world of home. Um, I'm actually a closet PC gamer. I've got an Xbox, but you know what? I actually like to um, use uh, Fly, for example, um, on a PC. Yep. I've got my big liquid cooled graphics card, hardcore old fashioned kind of guy. Um, but then we end up, you know, and you can see this desk is awash, we end up with all these devices. But actually, I'm just Andrew Fryer. You know, you can find my blog, you can, uh, you can find me on Facebook, you can find me on Twitter, but I also have a day job. And I really, you know, if I'm on a plane or I'm traveling somewhere, I really just want to be able to carry one thing with me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like um, not having to, you know, like with the other week when we were in Jersey, you know, we actually checked four laptops in through baggage. Now, we're doing demos, so I kind of get that. But if I was a business person, I don't think I'd really want to be doing that. Yeah, I'd absolutely. Want you want one to thing. A, no, a no compromise experience there. You don't want to have to cart lots of different devices around. Now, the reality is you may have different devices for different mm. types of scenarios. You might have a, um, a device which is, say, running on the ARM platform, um, mm. like the Microsoft Surface that we released a little while ago. That will give you fantastic long battery life. Be a really, really nice, portable device to take around. You might, however, still want a desktop device back at home for doing all your gaming, mm. all of that mm. really hardcore stuff you do. So people are going to have multiple different devices, and we expect to be able to move between those devices completely seamlessly. Well, yeah. I, I guess I, I kind of want to do my stuff where, wherever I am, and uh, be that on the, on the phone, on a, um, on a, in an internet cafe, or wherever. Else. But equally, the, the, and this is the dichotomy, really. The, the IT department are 
struggling with this, mm -hmm. um, freeing up this control. We've talked about the tight control we've had with early versions of Windows, um, where we're locking everything down. And now we're in a world where we can't lock some things down. We need to think more about what people are doing rather than just a can't, you know, you can't do this on this machine. Yeah, absolutely. And lots of that lockdown came out of a real need to be able to, mm. um, to deliver this kind of lockdown. So if we look at traditionally um, what happened with a, a Windows um, 7 type application, that application would run under the user's context on their machine. It would be able to do pretty much anything that a user can do. Yep. That's changed with Windows 8 applications. Windows 8 apps don't right. run okay. in that exact same context. If you think about the, um, the model of security inside of Windows yep. 7 and Windows 8, what they're actually doing is running in very th much a similar um, model as, Windows, as uh, Internet Explorer runs in, i.e. slightly less than user privileges normally, mm -hmm. and therefore we are a little bit more restrictive over what that application can do to our system. Because there must be loads of concerns about you know, the various stores and so on that are out there, yeah. um, and um, you know, casual gaming is what I see as one of the biggest uses of people on slates. You know, we've been playing from everything from you know, various um, angry, um, feathered, um, flightless things. Um, we, we've got people playing Sudoku, um, but then they might just want to dip in and, and, and play an email. And so I guess there's that. And then there's, then if I, so that's the application world. And then the other problem I guess we've got is data. Yeah. Uh, that we've, we've got um, personal data, mm -hmm. like my profile and, and what have you, my blogs. And, and then I've got access to corporate data. And again, I might just want to be doing that from one device. And, but I, sometimes I want that data to follow me or be accessible wherever I am. And I guess finally, Simon, is, is the world of um, connected and unconnected devices. We still, 4G is just about launched here as we're trying 4G in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, 5G is coming to America, so we're a little behind there. Broadband isn't as good and as persuasive as we'd like to think it is, and neither even a 3G connection. So we need to have access to stuff offline as well. Absolutely, we absolutely do. So we have a lot of uh, possibilities inside of Windows yeah. 8. We have things like um, the ability to encrypt devices and also the ability to uh, encrypt mobile devices as well, things like um, USB sticks, that kind of thing. We also have a virtualization layer in there, which actually enables many more um, different scenarios that we may have seen before, much mm. richer virtualization than we've ever right. had. Right, yeah, because so obviously I tend to think about, I think a lot of people think about virtualization just about uh, you know, running multiple copies of Windows Server on some big piece of tin sitting in a data center, but it's much more than that. Yeah, absolutely. So lots of different things. We are going to see lots of new devices coming into market over the course of uh, the next few months, and they are really going to change the way that people are, uh, are using this kind of yeah. stuff. If I get five minutes, I'm going to run out, by the way. I've just noticed we've got one device is conspicuous by its absence on our desk here. We do, absolutely. So uh, we will m uh, maybe try and re resolve that so a little bit longer. So just live, I'll go and see if I can, I can go and uh, mug somebody out in the corridor and get a surface. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we also want different devices that do very, very different mm. things. Windows 8 has, comes in different editions, and it's really important to know uh, exactly right. what you get with each edition. So yeah. um, as we go through the morning, we'll try and call some of this out. But um, broadly speaking, we have uh, three different editions of Windows 8. Mm -hmm. We have Windows 8, which is actually what uh, people will generally use at home. It's yep. generally the, the sort of entry um, into the market of Windows 8. So you've got rid of some of these lower end kind of skews that used to confuse people a bit. Things like home and all those kind of things, they've gone away. They've all been combined into Windows 8. And Windows 8 is the thing that actually has all the touch experiences, all of that kind of um, great stuff is actually in the box. We also have um, Windows uh, 8 Pro. And Windows 8 Pro has extra stuff inside of that. So yeah. with Windows 8 Pro, we can, for example, have uh, richer media experiences inside that machine. Yeah. And we also have Windows 8 Enterprise. And that's probably the, um, the area where we're going to look at a lot of features from today. Right. Because lots of the really cool stuff opens up, within, up with Windows 8 Enterprise. Not to say that there's not loads of great stuff with pr other versions. But some of the really high end, the stuff that yeah. organizations really, really want is actually an enterprise. So the, 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 I guess one of, the, one of the perceptions might be is that Windows 8 Enterprise takes away maybe some of the consumer stuff. Because I had an email last night, some of the um, sort of talking about Win, uh, Media Player and Codex and so on and so forth. But that isn't the case. Is Absolutely. It? No, all of, the ver all of the, you always add into the version. So Windows 8 Enterprise has everything that Pro does. Um, Pro has everything that Windows 8 has. Right. And, um, and yeah, and that, but and obviously enterprise is typically the one that we join the domain. Absolutely. And I think the other thing, if, while I'm on the subject of editions, that we used to get a little bit hammered about was that BitLocker was only available in Enterprise, enterprise. And Ultimate. Yeah. It's now available in Pro as well. Right. Okay. So that's again one of those areas where that's drawn down, and we're actually making 
everybody able to use BitLocker now? Because I absolutely want to be able to protect my personal data back to back to my Absolutely, comments. yeah. And we've also made BitLocker work in a far more effective way for touch devices. So, for example, you don't now have to actually enter a, um, a PIN number mm -hmm. when you're logging into a touch device. And the reason for that is it's actually um, a redundant level of security. BitLocker is a two-factor authentication mechanism by default. It actually has um, some extra piece of information stored in the TPM on the device or on a USB card. And that, plus the information on the hard drive, that's your two-factor authentication. You don't right. need a third piece of information. Okay. It was just like a little comfort blanket that we've, uh, that we've kind of taken away from it, because <laughs> it's actually completely unnecessary. So, but hopefully that's not going to annoy the IT security people. We're still going to, obviously, one of the challenges we face is that we get a lot of, um, a lot of people asking us about security, yep. quite naturally. Absolutely. And it was only probably about a year ago that we had the uh, certifications necessary to run Windows 7 in government because it takes governments about a year to run. So they yep. can only work on RTM code. So it's going to be a while before you get the, get the definitive word from the Computer Evaluation Security Group, CSG, yep. that says this is OK for UK government. But nonetheless, they're testing it right now. And it's already been, a lot of this technology as well has already been tested and proven in previous versions of Windows, so in Windows 7 and those kind of versions. And, and just to show you, we are doing this live. You see, if, if you ask kindly enough, somebody brings you... Brings you a piece of equipment. Oh, look, there's a surface. Okay, so this is actually <laughs> uh, very, very timely delivered. Um, this is a, obviously a Surface device. There we go. There's a nice kickstand yeah. kicks out there. Um, this is actually running Dan's live account, so I don't think yeah. we'll, uh, we'll go over to that we too have, quickly. We have been putting all sorts of rubbish on there, yes, haven't we? Yes, <laughs> we've, uh, we've been installing stuff onto this. This is a uh, Windows RT device. It's been running for a little bit of time. It's got a little tiny um, drop in battery life at the moment. But uh, what is really important to note about it is um, it is a Windows RT device. So it is running a slightly different version of Windows uh, to sort of the Windows 8 that you would run, run on, a, uh, on a normal platform like uh, x86 on yeah. uh, ARM or x64. Um, so the difference is there are kind of interesting and worth noting. You can't domain join that device. Right. So it is intended more as a, um, yep. as a bring to enter the bring your own device kind of space. We can, however, do lots of very, very useful management of it, um, which is enabled in a slightly different way. Oh. Actually, we're not going to cover that today. OK. Um, it's a little bit out outside of the scope, because we're actually talking more about Enterprise What's Windows 8 here and what we can do there. So right. we'll do another session at some point where we'll go into um, using your Windows RT device in a little bit more um, of a holistic way. But we can do things like um, deploy remote apps out to that device to enable people yep. to be able to access um, a legacy application on that device, just like we would have done um, with previous versions of Windows. Gotcha. OK, thank you, Simon. Absolutely. Right, so I'm conscious I keep asking all these questions. I suppose we ought to press on. Yes. OK, so um, just so that people can start to play along today at home, um, in order to be able to do what, we, what we're doing today, you're going to need to go and get a couple of evaluations. The first thing you're going to need is the Windows Server 2012 evaluation, even if you want to play with Windows 8. Yeah, it's a good point, because um, if you want to be certified as a desktop admin, you're going to need to do three core server exams you are. In, uh, to become MCSA and Windows Server, and then two extra exams on Windows 8 to become a desktop guy. Absolutely. So a lot of the stuff we're showing you today is all about policies and, um, uh, and other configurations that we're going to do on the server. Absolutely, because if you want to be super frosty on the desktop, you need to know how um, Active Directory works. You need to know how uh, dynamic access control works. You need to know how direct access works. You need to be able to deploy VDI environments and RDS environments. Absolutely key yep. skills. So uh, going and getting the Windows Server 2012 evaluation is a really good start. And of course, it disappears of its own, own tail anyway, because the first thing I'd tell you to do is to get Windows 8, install the remote server administration tools on it, and do your server administration from Windows from 8. Windows 8. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. You, you could even deploy that out, and then it just gets, gets completely Absolutely, strange. Absolutely, yeah, you can deploy it as a remote app. <laughs> we'll go there a little bit later on. Thank you, Simon, sorry. So um, if people can go and download that Windows Server 2012 evaluation, the next thing that they want to do is take a screenshot email it into our email address, which is uh, UKITPro at Microsoft.com. Yep. And we've got some folks who are monitoring that email address. They will um, take your, uh, your nice, lovely um, bitmap that you send them, which has the uh, evaluation information in the bottom right-hand corner. By default, when you install Windows Server 2012 eval, you'll see that in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. They'll take that, and then they will send you a T-shirt that says, I actually tried the Windows Server 2012 eval. So we know can then start to get more people trying out the evaluation and getting uh, Windows Server 2012 more widely adopted. Great for everybody because the more widely it's adopted, um, the more we move the whole platform on, but also um, the more that newer skills become much more relevant to people. Indeed. It's much more fun playing with the new stuff. It That's is. just the way Absolutely. I look at it. Yeah. So if we have a look at um, starting to think about what we've done inside of Windows yeah. Server 2012 and uh, what we've actually done to enable more flexible work styles inside of Windows 8. Well, this is, this is kind of a little bit back to my world. And people, um, I used to get beaten up a lot um, by other, other virtualization vendors about the fact that Microsoft isn't serious about VDI. You know, we just, we just had something in there just to show we could do it. Well, actually, I think that's a load of um, FUD. 
mm -hmm. and uh, you can see the very first evidence you'll see of that is when we cut to the demo because you actually have a special way of setting up VDI. Yep. We wouldn't have put that in there if you didn't need to. Secondly, um, we ran a Windows 8 camp, I think, the other, uh, other Friday, didn't we? We did. With the laptops, with a couple of laptops we have at the front, I know it looks like we've got a pile of them, there's actually about three out here. We were able to provide Windows 8 to the entire room using, using VDI yep. um, over a wireless network so they could actually do labs um, and actually test out some of the deployment technologies you were talking, going to talk about later. Yeah, absolutely. So we were able to give them lots of stuff. Really important thing there, they were able to access our environment in a secure way. Yes, absolutely. Because they were yeah. just accessing uh, a remote desktop session. Yeah, they needed their domain creds and so on to get in, which we, we gave them. We created those domain accounts. We were able to stand up a well-managed desktop, um, what, within about an hour? Yeah, absolutely. And most of that was actually um, getting disks spinning mm -hmm. as we've made copies of uh, virtual hard disks and so on to get that stuff yeah. working. And so really performant. And absolutely. Uh, you know, management is, is thought of and built in from the from the very start with this. So, uh, one of the typical scenarios that we used to encounter was that people would need to patch that VDI environment. Mm. Now we've actually built that kind of mechanism in to enable um, updates of your VDI environment yeah. in a far more holistic and sensible way. I think in this one of the, one of the challenges for me is in this user centric world that we live in. The, the, the real kicker is that people who haven't got their own device anymore somehow feel like second class citizens. Yeah. And I think what's really good about our VDI is that uh, if you've got, you know, say a decent sized screen, well the screen size is the screen size is the screen size, and we've got a well managed desktop, we can give the users exactly the same experience as they would get if they had their own machine. Moreover, they can go from room to room, to office to office, to location to location, and get that same personalized experience. So we can kind of deliver on that dream, even without necessarily rolling out laptops everywhere. So if you think about a lab or a manufacturing environment, bank and so on, as you move from boardroom to meeting room, and there were devices in there, language labs in schools, all those kinds of things, military installations, we can, we can deliver all that goodness to people. Absolutely, and moving from device to device is obviously something that people commonly want to do. There is, of, of, of course, no requirement to have a, a device which is running Windows mm. in order to be able to talk into um, a right, environment well, that's, that's running VDI well. or, yeah. in fact, uh, running RDS. We can use uh, any remote desktop uh, protocol yeah. client in order to be able to access that device. Uh, we don't. No. So, um, so, you know, we can access with any kind of piece of equipment that's out there. Yeah, and we can repurpose old, old equipment as well. Absolutely, um, yeah. So, uh, and there's that um, licensing thing for doing yes, that. Yes, absolutely. Part of SA. So, um, I think we've probably gone through um, some of the benefits. What I would say about VDI is that the, because you virtualize your desktops, it doesn't make management any easier. The only thing you have done is you pulled all of your users' profiles and state into a central server, but that's just like having a big cage warehouse and everybody's laptops are in that cage. Just because they're in one physical location doesn't necessarily mean that they're easy to manage. Yeah, so absolutely. I don't think you moving to VDI is going to solve your management problems. You need efficient management, whichever solution you go for, Completely. but we've made that easier. Yeah, we absolutely. And we've also made uh, richer experiences much easier as well. Yeah. So if we look at the uh, at what's available, and we're going to talk about what's available on a Microsoft platform here, because frankly, um, it's just too new for everybody else to have updated for those goals and to have come to us and, yeah. and licensed. So we're going to show raw VDI it. without some of our partners' integration. Um, I'm thinking Absolutely. Quest, Citrix, and yeah. so on and so forth. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So very important. But we can still deliver really, really rich multimedia experiences. In mm -hmm. fact, Windows 8 allows us to deliver much richer uh, multimedia experiences inside of a virtual desktop or, in fact, an RDS environment than we've ever seen before. And we'll start to have a look at that a little bit later on. Okay. We also get little things like um, natively being able to redirect storage devices, which is incredibly useful for, mm. um, for users. If they are connecting in from a machine, they expect to plug in a USB stick and have that available to them in their remote session. I've just had a crazy epiphany. I mean, I was listening to Radio 4 the other night about a hospital here in Reading that um, was using Connect for um, <laughs> surgery. So they, yeah. people with rubber gloves on didn't have to touch the screens because that's not good because you're going to get blood and brains all over, the, yeah. all over the desktop. So they were using Connect. So it occurs to me if they were running VDI, you could have a hardened device and the Connect sensor just connects over USB we'd see that sensor, mm -hmm. and so you could actually have a VDI experience using not even touch, but gesture. Yes, potentially, yeah, absolutely. So um, some of the new stuff that we can we do is we can now redirect webcams, uh, which is obviously an easier version yeah, of that, video conferencing directly yeah. into uh, the VDI client, which does mean that we can use things like Link in order to be able to do video conferencing 
direct from uh, a VDI session. I probably also want to authenticate, Simon. So Absolutely. I want to be able to um, you know, whack that in and, and, and uh, to the system to check who I am. So I need to be able to pass my smart card credentials in through VDI yeah, as well. Completely. So the experience is richer. Um, lots of that is enabled through remote effects, and we'll have a look at that in a second. Great. Um, we also want to make uh, management as easy as possible in this environment. Yeah. So things like user profile disks in this place, which uh, do a, a, a huge amount to uh, resolve some problems that we saw in the past. So if yeah. we think about a traditional um, VDI environment or a traditional RDS environment, when people are making changes to their profile, they're making those changes actually on the disks that are on the server. What we That's do with right, yeah, uh, VDI yeah. and with RDS uh, inside of Windows Server 2012 is we redirect that out to a, their own disk, a disk which is personal mm -hmm. to the user. So they all have a, so a virtual hard disk, is it? It is, is it a just virtual a hard disk. One? Yep, just a special oh. one which takes all of the, the users' read and writes to that environment. That obviously keeps your underlying environment much cleaner and it also makes it more portable. But, okay, so I've used um, differencing disks before, which I guess is what you're talking about here in my server world. But the problem there is if I patch my gold build of Windows 8 with all my Office 2013 on it and all that other good stuff, yeah. then I kind of lose the ability to reconnect those user disks, don't I? Uh, no. Really? There is, yep, there are ways around that. Okay. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yep. So I can keep my gold build of for my VDI environment up to date and users can still continue to to um, yes. connect in and keep their state as well. Absolutely. That's yep. well That's managed. Exactly time. it. Yep, that allows us to do exactly that. Cool. Um, also, um, it, it's very much along the lines of intelligent patching. That's exactly where we're coming to with that. Okay. The ability to patch those operating systems, those um, mm -hmm. child operating systems, which each individual is using, as a um, as a matter of course. So that's all going to be fairly expensive, right? Because I'm going to need to buy loads of tooling, like I guess System Center and. Nope. It's all completely in the box. It's all part of Windows Server 2012. There's no uh, requirement there to have external management. Of course, if you do want to scale that environment to right. really large levels, we're going to recommend going to partners like Citrix, like Quest, in order to actually um, yeah. enable some of that really kind of large scale management. But for um, for a lot of installations, it's actually going to be completely fine to take Windows Server out of the box and, and use it. And it's certainly something that people should give a try to. OK, cool. So, so if we also have a quick think about um, some of the other uh, technologies that play really well into this environment, we also have a new technology called user experience virtualization. And we're going to cover this in, a, um, in the virtualization yes. session a little bit later on today as well. But the really key thing to take away from uh, user experience virtualization uh, is that it's a, a much more modern way of moving your settings uh, between machines. So we enable a couple of machines. Uh, one could be remote desktop, one could be your own physical machine for user experience virtualization. And it will do um, such things as move your settings around. So you change Internet Explorer, and it will move those settings between machines, which is great. It occurs to me that must take up like lots of bandwidth and stuff. You know, I used to see like when you used to log on, you had roaming profiles, and it used to take all week to do that. Is that still going to be an issue? No, nope, it's very, very bandwidth efficient. There's lots of uh, clever stuff going on there to make sure that we are bandwidth efficient. We might have a quick look at that a little bit later on. Excellent. Okay. However, sorry, um, I keep asking these questions from okay. my own personal no, no. experience here. Yep. So I'm, I'm it, still uh, learning. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, really cool f stuff though here. So if we start an application on one machine mm -hmm. and we get to a certain point, we decide that um, we need to move over to a different device. Say we just need to go home. Mm. UEV, once we've logged off, will sync all of our running applications across to my remote device. And if the apps are actually there and installed, things like, um, for example, so I saw Where I left off my deck, for yeah, example. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, where you left off in your deck. I, the other day, was um, logged in, uh, had a Windows Explorer window open, mm -hmm. uh, viewing a uh, share on my machine. I then shut my machine down, opened up my tablet device, and it was already open on my tablet device by the time I logged in. So it just moved my state across for me. So it's a really, really cool technology and actually fantastic inside of a, uh, an RDS environment as well where people are moving between different types of yeah. machines. Yeah, and you might need to swap out a machine. I mean, if, heaven forbid, one of these uh, machines uh, collapsed on us, we could just, <laughs> just fire up another one and we'd be, we'd be away if we're running this on VDI. Absolutely, then. yeah. Cool, cool. So um, we're kind of uh, moving into, uh, into demo time, which is, is this uh, always I give the you best a device, part of the day. Man? I, I will actually take a device off of you uh, just you like now. this one? This I'll is a Samsung I'll take Series little, uh, 7 this Slate, I think. Surface device off of you. Uh, I'm just going to switch over to its oh, input. Sir, this isn't Surface. Sorry. It's a big Surface. It's, it's, a, Windows a, it's a, Windows, um, a Windows 7, uh, sorry, Windows 8 tablet device. So I'm just going to log into it, and we'll just switch over to uh, its display, which uh, hopefully is that one. Yeah, so it's got an i5 in it, just to be absolutely clear, it's not running Windows RT. Yeah, right. this is a, uh, a machine which is running uh, my, uh, my desktop just here, running Windows uh, RT. I'm just going to switch you over change here. Change your name to Alice, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Right. And this is Alice's own personal machine. It is, absolutely. And it's also just disconnected from a... Show you exactly what I'm doing on that machine. Oh yeah. Uh, except we are having a minor display problem. 
It's like you're, um, I think what it is, you're, you, it looks like to me you're extending rather than duplicating. Would that properly suggest? I'm not sure that I am. No, we're on Right. Okay, so we'll, we'll, have a little, we'll have a little play with this. We'll have a little look at that in a second. I'm just going to um, move back over here. Do you want me to have a look at that while you... Uh... Uh, yep, that would be great. Okay, that's why we've got two presenters. We've got defence in depth here. Um... Okay, so whilst that's doing that, we're just going to switch over to um, our setup machine here and just show you the environment that we've actually put in place. So here we are inside of uh, inside of Server Manager. We're looking at uh, our Windows 8 uh, Server M sorry, our Server 2012 environment here, and you can see that we are actually managing a whole load of different servers inside this environment. Uh, if you saw the multi-server management section yesterday, you'll have seen us actually adding uh, a bunch of these servers in. So in this case, we're actually managing these few servers here: RDSB, which is a remote desktop services broker server. So anybody who wants to connect into our environment is going to go through the broker so that we make sure that we connect them into the right kind of virtual machine for them. So if they need to connect into a remote desktop services server, into one of those sessions, we will connect them to that. And if they have an existing session, we'll connect them back into their existing session. If we need to connect them into a VDI environment, and that can be a pooled or a personal environment, we'll connect them into, say, a pooled environment, whereby we'll create a new virtual machine for them. They'll log into that virtual machine, and every time they log out, we'll reset back to a, a base point. Yeah. But if they, for example, uh, log in within 30 minutes back into the same machine, we'll just keep that machine running for them so that they get continuity of uh, all of their services. And in the environment of using a personal desktop, we'll actually, when we need to, spin up a personal desktop so that it's available to them. And if that machine happens to be shut off when they log into the environment, we will actually turn it on for them. So, so yeah, I think for me, this is all about consolidation and efficiency. The, the easiest way to give people a, sh uh, a shared desktop experience is, is use traditional session hosts. Yep. We can pack loads of users, typically five to 10 times more than we can even with pooled virtual desktops onto a given um, piece of tin. So that's the most efficient thing, but not everything runs in that kind of server application world. Not all applications are happy. So when we move to pooled, we sacrifice some disk and some compute in order to give people a pooled desktop. And the most difficult and hardest thing to manage is an individual virtual desktop. Because Absolutely. that is exactly like giving somebody their own their machine, machine. except it's executing yep. um, on our servers. Completely. And when we say it's the hardest thing to manage, it's not actually that hard to no, manage. No, but on a relative. And it's, but it's also the least efficient in terms of computing resources. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be perhaps another way of looking at it. Completely. So an RDS uh, gateway server, the second server just down here, this allows us to um, securely connect people in from across yep. the internet. Right. Um, and this RDS H2 server here, this is actually a session host server, indicated by the fact we call it RDS H. And yep. um, people will log into a server there, they will share sessions. We'll explain why that's important in a second. And finally, we have uh, an RDS WA server, which is our web access server. So that's going to provide a web page that people right. can use to log into and find. So the gateway sites. sits out there. Um, and is internet facing, and then people connect to the web access server. Yeah. The broker works out what services are available in the web access server, and then the session hosts and um, uh, virtual hosts provide those desktops and sessions. Yes, absolutely. Right. That's okay. exactly what we're doing. Okay, so in this case, we're just going to have a quick look at our remote desktop session setup, and we have actually configured our, yep. Yeah, uh, we have actually configured um, this session so that we've uh, predefined all these services and set this up. Okay. So if we have a quick look down here, we get this nice handy little network map which shows oh, us what yep. we have uh, in place here. So it shows us that, that the web access server is out there and available. Things are going to talk through the connection broker and it's going to decide, the connection broker will decide whether we need to talk to a virtualization host or to a session host. Right. We very, very briefly covered what a session host was there. But a session host is actually um, a Windows Server 2012 server set up to look like it's Windows 8. So we've installed the desktop experience. Yeah, you even get the store, don't you? You do. You even get the store <laughs> inside of that. Um, you get access to use all of the Windows 8 applications. Everything looks like a Windows 8 machine. Virtualization host is actually one of these laptops just here in our case. It's actually a Windows Server 2012 server right. running Hyper-V with the Hyper-V um, virtualization host role installed. So everything else on this diagram except the bottom left-hand corner can be a virtual machine? Absolutely, yeah. Right. This, Purely this machine here. that is running virtual machines. Yep. And in fact, it could be the same, it could be the same host that these are running on if, you, Absolutely. if you're in yep. a small environment. Yep. But you, you, you might want to scale this out, which is why we've got these, these different roles. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Sorry, Simon, I'm just going to keep qualifying, keep, keep you honest here. So um, our new here we have a, a couple of levels down, these things that are highlighted in blue. And this is actually what we're publishing out to our end users. Right, OK. So in this case, we have, um, they're called collections. And we have a, um, a new camp pool collection. And we also have a session collection set mm -hmm. up. 
And if we have a quick look at what we're doing with these sessions, we can start to um, see what they're all about. So let's just scroll down a little bit here and move over to this sessions session. Mm -hmm. So this particular collection is actually a group of remote apps that we've published from our Windows Server 2012 installation, which is running the desktop experience pack. So here we've published out the best version of Calculator uh, that you ever might want to publish, which yep. is uh, Calculator. It's actually pre-configured to run in scientific mode as well, but uh, that's a, a minor yep. aside. We've published out Windows Media Player, yep. so anybody can connect in here, run um, videos in an RDS session. And your favourite application, Windows PowerShell ISE. Absolutely. Because what you perhaps don't know, obviously, if we had longer to present today, or you come along to one of our camps, is that Simon builds all the virtual machines that you've just seen and joins them into the domain and configures pretty much all of this from PowerShell. Yep. And, it, and then we can go for coffee while you're watching that uh, and not have to, have to present. But we did all that this morning uh, so you could have a line. Absolutely. We decided to set all that up in advance. Okay. And then if we have a quick look at our other pool here, we have this, uh, this collection, which is a, um, actually a virtual desktop pool collection. Right. So here we have a little bit of uh, a slightly different view. If we uh, have a look over here on the right-hand side, what we'll actually see is a bunch of virtual machines which are running on this London 3 server. Yep. And all of those machines are either in a running or save state, which means that users have been connected into them uh, within mm -hmm. a uh, relatively recent period of time. And uh, those machines are actually individual for each person, but rem remain part of a pool. So anybody that logs in that has access to that pool will get connected into one of those virtual machines. Yep. And it will get reset for them to a, uh, a static period in time. We'll have a look what that's doing in and a second. And there's obviously some secret source going on un under there in VDI. The London 3 is actually sitting under, uh, you probably can't see it, there's a grey laptop sitting underneath this little laptop. That's where we're running all those 10 virtual machines from. And we've enabled all the secret source in there, Simon. I know we haven't got too much time to talk about this, but essentially it's a very efficient way of running Windows 8 desktops. We're using dynamic memory to make sure that as people open and close applications, mm -hmm. we're making the most efficient use of the 16 gigs of RAM on there. And because um, we've enabled something called Remote FX, we get really good um, experiences on the user by spoofing essentially a graphics card um, into each of those virtual machines. Yeah, absolutely. So without actually using a graphics card, which yeah, is the clever thing in completely. 2012. We have, um, we ha actually do have, these laptops are, um, are a little bit naughty. They're actually uh, running on laptops, and they do have graphics card in them that are capable of running mm. um, with remote FX, so they're remote FX certified. Now, there's a couple of reasons why we're not, we're not actually making use of those graphics cards. For a start, we want to be able to show that we can use the soft GPU. So yep. if we turn off a hardware GPU, it will use the soft GPU. And of course, we, yeah, we can't put those graphics cards necessarily into a blade in a, in a big professional Absolutely. rack anyway. Yep. So that's why Com we've done it. Completely. Yep. You Sorry. might not have enough space in your, in your, um, in your one new pizza box server to be able to get in one of those really big, thick gaming graphics cards. So got we've kind home. of realized that. Yes, like you've got it at home. <laughs> um, we kind of realized that. So actually, that's now been, uh, we've got this soft GPU which you can use. Right. The other reason that we're not doing it is because actually the Windows 8 drivers that have been released for these particular machines, we haven't installed yet. So we wouldn't get the full graphics performance okay. that we'll uh, hopefully see a little bit later on. So we're all ready to go. So can we see one of these then? No. Minute? So just oh. under, the, uh, under the covers here, let's have a quick look at okay. um, what we are seeing from this uh, environment. I'm just going to go back up here very quickly, and um, we'll have a look at our Hyper-V environment, and have a look at London 3. Yep. And London 3, if we just refresh this, there we go. London 3 is showing us all those virtual machines that are, uh, that are actually running, and a bunch of other stuff as well, just to, just to kind of prove that this stuff uh, runs along in the background. You can see that the assigned memory uh, is down in the sort of 500 uh, megabytes for each one kind of area. Um, some of them have, gone, have uh, increased a little bit. This uh, machine that's highlighted is actually uh, not a remote desktop no, we'll session. Be, we'll be using that this afternoon in case you're wondering what that thing. In fact, it actually tells you at the bottom of the screen what it's running, Simon. Yep, that's running a fair <laughs> amount of stuff. This, however, this Windows 8 machine is actually running a, um, as a VDI session machine. And you'll see that we have this, uh, this VDI rollback in place here. So this isn't new in Windows Server 2012. It was there in Server 2008 R2. Just took a little bit of configuring. Now we configure that automatically. And what right. we're saying here is every time um, we create a machine, we'll create a snapshot. And that is the clean point on that machine. When somebody yep. logs off, 30 minutes later, we'll reset to that snapshot. So everybody that logs back into a machine gets a new clean machine. Yep. Within 30 minutes, if they log on, they get the machine they had before. It might not necessarily have been cleaned up because they might have programs running. I guess we're going to be asked if that's configurable or not. And it is, I uh, guess. Yeah, yes, yep. absolutely. Yep. Yep. You, can okay. the, uh, you can configure that timeout. If we have a quick look at the properties of this particular virtual machine, um, that'll show us a few little interesting things, uh, settings. So for a start, note that we don't actually have a uh, remote FX video adapter in there. That is actually grayed out at this point yep. because we haven't enabled uh, the remote FX features on this machine. They're just being used by default. Um, we also have uh, four processors. We could pop that up to, uh, to running eight on this machine. This no. is actually a running virtual machine, so no. we're not going to increase that. You can't 
on, oh yeah, sorry. Okay, yes, you, yes. Absolutely, sorry, absolutely you're right, Simon. Yeah, sorry. Uh, we had a we had a bit of a fun last night. One of our laptops died, but because we're using Hyper-V, we've just been able to swap out another laptop. But the yep. new one's only got four crocs, Simon. So, oh, is that? Okay, yeah, right. Sorry, I just before you go and change that setting. Um, you can notice that we are actually running this virtual machine from uh, from some uh, from a different location. If I have a look at the hard disk from it, we're actually running. Oh, that's excellent. We're running this virtual machine off of uh, one of our. Um, one of our highly available file stores, so it's actually yep. running centrally. It's not being run on the host machine's hardware or on its, the host machine's um, actual disk. It's being run off of one of our file servers. Yep, one of these new SMB3 shares. Absolutely. Yep. So important to note those things. If we pop back into uh, Server Manager again, we'll just go up and uh, just begin the process of deploying a pooled desktop. We won't yep. um, get all the way through this because it will take a little bit of time to actually get there. So I'm going to go in and uh, just create a new collection. Uh, surfaces uh, tend to disappear very quickly. Sorry about that. And uh, we'll just pop in and create ourselves a brand new collection. So I'm going to go up here yep. and create new virtual desktop collection. We'll say next on this wizard, we're going to give this a name. We're going to call it personal desktops. Right, so this is where I actually SLM. get my own. Yeah. Absolutely. We're going to use a personal virtual desktop collection for this. We're going to say next. And that's going to then go away, look at the potential um, environment that we have, and see what we can uh, host this on. It's going to bring us back all the servers which are uh, potentially capable of running as a virtualization host. Uh, in this case, I'm going to select uh, a server called uh, London. Uh, where is it? London. Oh, sorry. This is actually pulled back our, um, our templates. It's gone out and yeah, so I was say, those are, those are virtual yeah, machines, Simon, sorry. Yeah. So we, um, need to use your, we need to use your gold build, which is that Win8 VDI do not boot written absolutely. all over it. Yeah. That's the one. And the reason for that is that's actually a sysprepped um, Windows 8 machine. So yep. uh, I don't want anyone getting in there and We'd have carefully built that, and we could have put Office in it and other things as well. Yes, to do. completely. Yeah. I'm going to disable my automatic user assignments at this point, because I want to actually hand these machines out rather than have them assigned automatically. Right. And we're going to tick this to add the uh, user to the local administrators group on the virtual desktop. can be kind of handy for people. Um, we are then also going to um, provide some uh, information using the SysPrep on Ascend setting. So we'll say next. Mm -hmm. We'll drop in place the um, UK time UK zone, time zone because it's always good to actually use the UK time as opposed to uh, Seattle. We'll drop it into a particular OU. In this case, we're going to drop it into our camp users OU. So all the virtual machines and all the users that uh, our when, when you come on our camps go into that group. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Completely. Then we're going to say how many of these machines we want. Uh, we're going to say two, and we're going to call this, um, well, let's just use that per prefix. I'm sure it'll be fine. Yep. Then we're going to say whereabouts we want to place them. Uh, in this environment, I think uh, probably London 1 has got a little bit more capacity at the moment, so we'll just place that all onto London 1. We'll say next. Then we want to say whereabouts we're going to store them. We'll pop them onto our network share, which is um, HAVDI right. That's it, yeah. backslash VM store, I think. VM store. Time. Okay. We'll say next. And then we'll hit create. That's then going to go away and start to create those collections for us. It's going to take a little bit of time. So we could perhaps come back um, a little later on and have absolutely. a look at that, Simon. Yeah, that's going to take a little bit of time. It's going to tie up our, um, our session for us. Okay. So let's see if, our, uh, if we can get the next Yes, because you can now see the blue bar at the top of the screen. So this yeah. is a VDI environment. So I could just sort of half minimize that. Absolutely. The moment you can see that sitting inside. Well, you can drag it around better than I can already do that. There we go. Anyway, that's sitting inside a remote desktop session environment. Absolutely. So you see that we're getting full 3D graphics. We're getting multi-touch there. We actually get 10 points of multi-touch because this and is a 10 uh, multi-touch point device. And it's also not connected to anything. So yep. actually, you're getting that remote desktop over a wireless connection. Absolutely. Yep, that's all being delivered right. over wireless. Um, just a bog standard, uh, in fact, here's the, uh, here's the access point, just sat here. Yep. Just a bog standard um, 802.11g uh, connection. It's obviously just a couple of feet away from me, but we've also um, so had quite a few machines being shared over that. Simon, that's really impressive. Yep, 10 points of multi-touch and full 3D without any 3D hardware being used um, and redirecting all those multi-touch points. OK. Which is, uh, which is kind of cool. I'm just going to go on and, uh, and just do uh, another couple of little bits and bobs here. 
Uh, the first one is, I'm gonna, just going to go and uh, turn on a couple of webcams, because now we can redirect our webcams through, yeah. um, through the, uh, the session here. It says. There we go. And what I'm going to do is just um, take a quick picture of Andrew using the camera app, just to prove it. Hello, where am I? That's probably a good, I've got a face for radio, so it's probably, it's probably been automatically vetted out. Oh, there we go. There we go. Quick picture of Andrew. <laughs> there we go. There he is. All <laughs> posterity saved onto my tablet. <laughs> so let's just get rid of the camera. So <laughs> redirecting the camera straight through from our actual device through into our VDI session. Let's go and have a quick look at some of the other stuff that we can do here. Uh, I'll just pop into, um, well, this video looks quite cool. I'm going to start up Internet Explorer and have a quick look at this, uh, this little video thing. Um, I don't need to do that. I don't have Facebook on this machine. Yeah, let's get rid of that. Go away. Go away. Yeah, so it's good to see some privacy in that action there. So, yeah. Um, so, and this is a, uh, obviously a, a YouTube video being delivered via... Um, so a full screen that. And yep, so uh, that's a, a YouTube video actually being delivered uh, via Flash there, Adobe Flash Player. So we've got a, we've got a kind of a side channel um, with um, VDI so that the Flash traffic Absolutely. actually is super compressed. And actually, I think you were telling me plays faster than it does on a real... Uh, well, it's, it's, it's actually being streamed directly from YouTube straight yeah. through, the, uh, through the connection there. So completely Flash coming out from, uh, from this device. Really kind of nice and a uh, little nice, neat little demo. I'll just br bring us back to the start menu. Obviously, we have all of our normal apps inside of here. So sure. uh, if we wanted to go along, uh, pop into the Windows Store. Windows Store is going to work. Um, we have everything that's available as, uh, as desktop apps as well. So um, all so that kind of a personal stuff. desktop, those applications I've gone the store will, be, will persist. But if I go to a pool desktop, they're going to get trashed anyway. Absolutely. Yep, awesome. you've got so it. That's a quick way of getting rid of stuff, yeah, right? Completely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> OK, Simon, that was a, a lightning run through of um, VDI. The collection's still going. If we get time, perhaps we'll come back and yep, have a We'll probably have a have quick a look, look at that. that. But notice that I don't actually have to sit through um, this wizard screen no. to uh, let everything finish. I'm just going to hit the close button. And that'll get rid of that, and it'll just run away in the background for me. So uh, really kind of handy. And I can go through and associate those with people as I used to be able to. I do just want to show off one very quick, uh, okay. quick feature. We have a, a pool that we prepared earlier here. And I'm just going to pop in and just show you how we would do one of those things to, um, to actually go and patch those machines. So what I would do in this case is I would go to my Hyper-V environment here, and I'd find my, uh, my pool desktop, this VDI uh, machine, which is my, my template machine, uh, wherever I've placed it. There we go. Yeah, there this it is. Yeah, that one there. I'd then um, actually mount that machine and offline service it using DISM so that I could patch it offline, wouldn't have to mm -hmm. boot that mm -hmm. machine up or anything. I would then just pop back into uh, my server manager, go along to my virtual desktop collection that I want to go and uh, patch, and I'd then go and do re recreate all virtual desktops. So it, it takes all those individual disks and then bolts them, that's the business of gluing them back in again. Uh, what it's actually going to do there is it's going to go through and say, okay, the, all of these machines are pooled, they're all created from mm. an original, and they're actually all par uh, parent and child mm. relationship. So we'll delete all the children, we will then go and recreate the parent from that um, library disk that we had before, and then we'll regenerate all the children that we need, and then they'll all be patched. We'll be in a situation where everyone has been updated. What happens if somebody's running their virtual desktop while you're doing that, Simon? You have to make sure that this happens out of hours. Right, okay. It has to be just, an, an out of hours activity.